Section four of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The South Pole by Roal Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section four. Plan and Preparations. Part one. The deity of success is a woman and she insists on being one, not courted. You've got to seize her and bear her off, instead of standing under her window with a mandolin. Rex Beach The North Pole is reached. In a flash the news spread over the world, the goal of which so many had dreamed, for which so many had labored and suffered and sacrificed their lives, was attained. It was in September, 1909, that the news reached us. At the same instant, I saw quite clearly that the original plan of the Fram's third voyage, the exploration of the North Polar Basin, hung in the balance. If the expedition was to be saved, it was necessary to act quickly and without hesitation. Just as rapidly as the message had traveled over the cables, I decided on my change of front, to turn to the right about, and face to the south. It was true that I had announced in my plan that the Fram's third voyage would be in every way a scientific expedition, and would have nothing to do with record-breaking. It was also true that many of the contributors who had so warmly supported me had done so with the original plan before them, but in view of the altered circumstances, and the small prospect I now had of obtaining funds for my original plan— I considered it neither mean nor unfair to my supporters to strike a blow that would at once put the whole enterprise on its feet, retrieve the heavy expenses that the expedition had already incurred, and save the contributions from being wasted. It was therefore with a clear conscience that I decided to postpone my original plan for a year or two, in order to try in the meantime to raise the funds that were still lacking. The North Pole— the last problem, but one of popular interest in polar exploration, was solved. If I was now to succeed in arousing interest in my undertaking, there was nothing left for me but to try to solve the last great problem, the South Pole. I know that I have been reproached for not having at once made the extended plan public, so that not only my supporters, but the explorers who were preparing to visit the same regions might have knowledge of it. I was well aware that these reproaches would come, and had therefore carefully weighed this side of the matter. As regards the former, the contributors to my expedition, my mind was soon at rest. They were all men of position, and above discussing the application of the sums they had dedicated to the enterprise. I knew that I enjoyed such confidence among these people that they would all judge the circumstances aright and know that when the time came, their contributions would be used for the purpose for which they were given. And I have already received countless proofs that I was not mistaken. Nor did I feel any great scruples with regard to the other Antarctic expeditions that were being planned at the time. I knew I should be able to inform Captain Scott of the extension of my plans before he left civilization, and therefore a few months sooner or later could be of no great importance. Scott's plan and equipment were so widely different from my own that I regarded the telegram that I sent him later, with the information that we were bound for the Antarctic regions, rather as a mark of courtesy than as a communication which might cause him to alter his program in the slightest degree. The British expedition was destined entirely for scientific research. The Pole was only a side issue, whereas in my extended plan it was the main object— on this little detour, science would have to look after itself, but, of course, I knew very well that we could not reach the Pole by the route I had determined to take without enriching, in a considerable degree, several branches of science. Our preparations were entirely different, and I doubt whether Captain Scott, with his great knowledge of Antarctic exploration, would have departed in any point from the experience he had gained, and altered his equipment in accordance with that which I found it best to employ. For I came far short of Scott, both in experience and means. 
As regards Lieutenant Charais in the Cane and Maru, I understood it to be his plan to devote his whole attention to King Edward the Seventh land. After thus thoroughly considering these questions, I came to the conclusion I have stated, and my plan was irrevocably fixed. If at that juncture I had made my intention public, it would only have given occasion for a lot of newspaper discussion, and possibly have ended in the project being stifled at its birth. Everything had to be got ready quietly and calmly. My brother, upon whose absolute silence I could blindly rely, was the only person I led into the secret of my change of plan, and he did me many important services during the time when we alone shared the knowledge. Then, Lieutenant Thorvald Nielsen, at that time first officer of the Fram, now her commander, returned home, and I considered it my duty to inform him immediately of my resolve. The way in which he received it made me feel safe in my choice of him. I saw that in him I had found not only a capable and trustworthy man, but a good comrade as well, and this was a point of the highest importance. If the relations between the chief and the second-in-command are good, much unpleasantness and many unnecessary worries can be avoided. Besides which, a good understanding in this quarter gives an example to the whole ship. It was a great relief to me when Captain Nielsen came home in January 1910, and was able to help, which he did with a good will, a capability, and a reliability that I have no words to commend. The following was the plan of the Fram Southern Voyage. Departure from Norway, at latest before the middle of August. Madeira was to be the first and only place of call. From there a course was to be made on the best route for the sailing ship, for the Fram cannot be regarded as anything else. Southward through the Atlantic, and then to the east, passing to the south of the Cape of Good Hope and Australia, and finally pushing through the pack and into Ross Sea, about New Year. 1911. As a base of operations, I had chosen the most southerly point we could reach with the vessel, the Bay of Wales, in the Great Antarctic Barrier. We hoped to arrive here about January 15th. After having landed, the selected shore party, about ten men, with materials for a house, equipment, and provisions for two years, the Fram was to go out again and up to Buenos Aires, in order to carry out from there an oceanographical voyage across the Atlantic to the coast of Africa and back. In October, she was to return to the Bay of Wales and take off the shore party. So much, but no more, could be settled beforehand. The further progress of the expedition could only be determined later, when the work in the South was finished. My knowledge of the Ross Barrier was due to descriptions alone. But I had so carefully studied all the literature that treats of these regions, that on first encountering this mighty mass of ice, I felt as if I had known it for many years. After thorough consideration, I fixed upon the Bay of Wales as a winter station, for several reasons. In the first place, because we could there go farther south in the ship than at any other point, a whole degree farther south than Scott could hope to get in McMurdo Sound where he was to have his station, and this would be of very great importance in the subsequent sledge journey toward the pole. Another great advantage was that we came right on to our field of work, and could see from our hut door the conditions and surface we should have to deal with. Besides this, I was justified in supposing that the surface southward, from this part of the barrier, would be considerably better, and offer fewer difficulties than the piled-up ice along the land. In addition, animal life in the Bay of Wales was, according to the descriptions, extraordinarily rich, and offered all the fresh meat we required in the form of seals, penguins, and so forth. Besides these purely technical and material advantages which the barrier seemed to possess as a winter station, it offered a specially favorable site for an investigation of the meteorological conditions— since here one would be unobstructed by land on all sides. It would be possible to study the character of the barrier by daily observations on the very spot better than anywhere else. Such interesting phenomena as the movement, feeding, and calving of this immense mass of ice could, of course, be studied very fully at this spot. 
Last, but not least, there was the enormous advantage that it was comparatively easy to reach in the vessel. No expedition had yet been prevented from coming in here. I knew that this plan of wintering on the barrier itself would be exposed to severe criticism as recklessness, foolhardiness, and so forth, for it was generally assumed that the barrier was afloat here, as in other places. Indeed, it was thought to be so, even by those who had themselves seen it. Shackleton's description of the conditions at the time of his visit did not seem very promising. Mile after mile had broken away, and he thanked God he had not made his camp there. Although I have a very great regard for Shackleton, his work and his experience, I believe that in this case his conclusion was too hasty. Fortunately, I must add. For if, when Shackleton passed the Bay of Wales on January twenty fourth, 1908, and saw the ice of the bay in process of breaking up and drifting out, he had waited a few hours, or at the most a couple of days, the problem of the South Pole would probably have been solved long before December 1911. With his keen sight and sound judgment, it would not have taken him long to determine that the inner part of the bay does not consist of floating barrier, but that the barrier there rests upon a good, solid foundation, probably in the form of small islands, skerries, or shoals, and from this point he and his able companions would have disposed of the South Polar question once for all. But circumstances willed it otherwise, and the veil was only lifted, not torn away. I had devoted special study to this peculiar formation in the barrier, and had arrived at the conclusion that the inlet that exists to-day in the Ross Barrier, under the name of the Bay of Wales, is nothing else than the self-same bite that was observed by Sir James Clark Ross. No doubt with great changes of outline, but still the same. For seventy years, then, this formation, with the exception of the pieces that had broken away, had persisted in the same place. I therefore concluded that it could be no accidental formation. What once, in the dawn of time, arrested the mighty stream of ice at this spot, and formed a lasting bay in its edge, which with few exceptions runs in an almost straight line, was not merely a passing whim of the fearful force that came crashing on, but something even stronger than that, something that was firmer than the hard ice, namely the solid land. Here in this spot, then, the barrier piled itself up and formed the bay we now call the Bay of Wales. The observations we made during our stay there confirm the correctness of this theory. I therefore had no misgivings in placing our station on this part of the barrier. The plan of the shore party was, as soon as the hut was built and provisions landed, to carry supplies into the field, and lay down depots as far to the south as possible. I hoped to get such a quantity of provisions brought down to latitude 80 degrees south, that we should be able to regard this latitude as the real starting place of the actual sledge journey to the pole. We shall see later that this hope was more than fulfilled, and a labor many times greater than this was performed. By the time this depot work was accomplished, winter would be before us, and with the knowledge we had of the conditions in the Antarctic regions, every precaution would have to be taken to meet the coldest and probably the most stormy weather that any polar expedition had hitherto encountered. My object was, when winter had once set in, and everything in the station was in good working order, to concentrate all our forces upon the one object, that of reaching the pole. I intended to try to get people with me who were specially fitted for outdoor work in the cold. Even more necessary was it to find men who were experienced dog-drivers. I saw what a decisive bearing this would have on the result. There are advantages and disadvantages in having experienced people with one on an expedition like this. The advantages are obvious. If a variety of experiences are brought together and used with common sense, of course a great deal can be achieved. The experience of one man will often come in opportunely where that of another falls short. The experiences of several will supplement each other, and form something like a perfect whole. This is what I hope to obtain. But there is no rose without a thorn. 
If it has its advantages, it also has its drawbacks. The drawback to which one is liable in this case is that some one or other may think he possesses so much experience that every opinion but his own is worthless. It is, of course, regrettable when experience takes this turn, but with patience and common sense it can be broken of it. In any case, the advantages are so great and predominant that I had determined to have experienced men to the greatest extent possible. It was my plan to devote the entire winter to working at our outfit, and to get it as near to perfection as possible. Another thing to which we should have to give some time was the killing of a sufficient number of seals to provide fresh meat both for ourselves and our dogs for the whole time. Scurvy, the worst enemy of polar expeditions, must be kept off at all cost, and to achieve this it was my intention to use fresh meat every day. It proved easy to carry out this rule, since every one, without exception, preferred seal meat to tinned foods. And when spring came, I hoped that my companions and I would be ready, fit and well, with an outfit complete in every way. The plan was to leave the station as early in the spring as possible. If we had set out to capture this record, we must at any cost get there first. Everything must be staked upon this. From the very moment when I had formed the plan, I had made up my mind that our course from the Bay of Wales must be set due south, and follow the same meridian, if possible, right up to the pole. The effect of this would be that we should traverse an entirely new region, and gain other results besides beating the record. I was greatly astonished to hear, on my return from the south, that some people had actually believed we had set our course from the Bay of Wales for Beardmore Glacier, Shackleton's route, and followed it to the south. Let me hasten to assure them that this idea never, for a single instant, crossed my mind when I made the plan. Scott had announced that he was going to take Shackleton's route, and that decided the matter. During our long stay at Framheim, not one of us ever hinted at the possibility of such a course— Without discussion, Scott's route was declared out of bounds. No, due south was our way, and the country would have to be difficult indeed to stop our getting on to the plateau. Our plan was to go south, and not to leave the meridian unless we were forced to do so by insuperable difficulties. I foresaw, of course, that there would be some who would attack me and accuse me of shabby rivalry and so forth and they would perhaps have had some shadow of justification if we had really thought of taking Captain Scott's route. But it never occurred to us for a moment. Our starting point lay 350 geographical miles from Scott's winter quarters in McMurdo Sound, so there could be no question of encroaching upon his sphere of action. Moreover, Professor Nansen, in his direct and convincing way, has put an end once for all to this twaddle, so that I need not dwell upon it any longer. I worked out the plan as here given at my home on Bundefjord, near Christiania, in September 1909, and as it was laid, so was it carried out to the last detail. That my estimate of the time it would take was not so very far out is proved by the final sentence of the plan. Thus, we shall be back from the polar journey on January 25th. It was on January 25, 1912, that we came into Framheim after our successful journey to the Pole. This was not the only time our calculations proved correct. Captain Nielsen showed himself to be a veritable magician in this way. While I contented myself with reckoning dates, he did not hesitate to go into hours. He calculated that we should reach the barrier on January 15, 1911. This is a distance of 16,000 geographical miles from Norway. We were at the barrier on January 14th, one day before the time. There was not much wrong with that estimate. In accordance with the Storthing's resolution of February 9th, 1909, the Fram was lent for the use of the expedition, and a sum of 75,000 kroner, 4,132 pounds sterling, was voted for repairs and necessary alterations. The provisions were chosen with the greatest care, and packed with every precaution. All groceries were soldered in tin boxes, and then enclosed in strong wooden cases. 
the packing of tinned provisions is of enormous importance to a polar expedition. It is impossible to give too much attention to this part of the supplies. Any carelessness, any perfunctory packing on the part of the factory, will as a rule lead to scurvy. It is an interesting fact that on the four Norwegian polar expeditions— the three voyages of the Fram and the Gyoya voyage, not a single case of scurvy occurred. This is good evidence of the care with which these expeditions were provisioned. In this matter we owe a deep debt of gratitude, above all, to Professor Sophus Torup, who has always been the supervising authority in the matter of provisioning, this time as well as on the former occasions. Great praise is also due to the factories that supplied our tinned goods. By their excellent and conscientious work, they deserved well of the expedition. In this case, a part of the supplies was entrusted to a Stavanger factory, which, in addition to the goods supplied to order, with great generosity, placed at the disposal of the expedition provisions to the value of two thousand kroner, a hundred ten pounds, the other half of the tin foods required was ordered from a firm at Moss. The manager of this firm undertook at the same time to prepare the necessary pemmican for men and dogs, and executed this commission in a way that I cannot sufficiently praise. Thanks to this excellent preparation, the health both of men and dogs on the journey to the Pole was always remarkably good. The pemmican we took was essentially different from that which former expeditions had used. Previously, the pemmican had contained nothing but the desired mixture of dried meat and lard. Ours had, besides these, vegetables and oatmeal, an addition which greatly improves its flavor, and as far as we could judge, makes it easier to digest. This kind of pemmican was first produced for the use of the Norwegian army. It was intended to take the place of the emergency ration. The experiment was not concluded at the time the expedition left, but it may be hoped that the result has proved satisfactory. A more stimulating, nourishing, and appetizing food it would be impossible to find. But besides the pemmican for ourselves, that for our dogs was equally important, for they are just as liable to be attacked by scurvy as we men. The same care had, therefore, to be devoted to the preparation of their food. We obtained from Moss two kinds of pemmican, one made with fish and the other with meat. Both kinds contained, besides the dried fish or meat and lard, a certain proportion of dried milk and middlings. Both kinds were equally excellent, and the dogs were always in splendid condition. The pemmican was divided into rations of one pound, one-half ounces, and could be served out to the dogs as it was. But before we should be able to use this pemmican, we had a five months' voyage before us, and for this part of the expedition I had to look for a reliable supply of dried fish. This I found through the agent of the expedition at Tromso, Mr. Fritz Sapfa. Two well-known firms also placed large quantities of the best dried fish at my disposal. With all this excellent fish and some barrels of lard, we succeeded in bringing our dogs through, in the best of condition. One of the most important of our preparations was to find good dogs. As I have said, I had to act with decision and promptitude if I was to succeed in getting everything in order. The day after my decision was made, therefore, I was on my way to Copenhagen, where the inspectors for Greenland— Messrs. Dogar Jensen and Benson, were to be found at that moment. The director of the Royal Greenland Trading Company, Mr. Rydberg, showed, as before, the most friendly interest in my undertaking, and gave the inspectors a free hand. I then negotiated with these gentlemen, and they undertook to provide one hundred of the finest Greenland dogs, and to deliver them in Norway in July 1910. The dog question was thus as good as solved since the choice was placed in the most expert hands. I was personally acquainted with Inspector Dogar Jensen from former dealings with him, and knew that whatever he undertook would be performed with the greatest conscientiousness. The administration of the Royal Greenland Trading Company gave permission for the dogs to be conveyed free of charge on board the Hans Ejid and delivered at Christiansen. End of Section 4 
of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martina. The South Pole by Roll Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 5, Volume 1, Chapter 2. Plan and Preparations, Part 2. Before I proceed to our further equipment, I must say a few more words about the dogs. The greatest difference between Scott's and my equipment lay undoubtedly in our choice of draught animals. We had heard that Scott, relying on his own experience and that of Shackleton, had come to the conclusion that Manchurian ponies were superior to dogs on the barrier. Among those who were acquainted with the Eskimo dog, I do not suppose I was the only one who was startled on first hearing this. Afterwards, as I read the different narratives, and was able to form an accurate opinion of the conditions of surface and going, my astonishment became even greater. Although I had never seen this part of the Antarctic regions, I was not long in forming an opinion diametrically opposed to that of Shackleton and Scott, for the conditions both of going and surface were precisely what one would desire for sledging with Eskimo dogs, to judge from the descriptions of these explorers. If Perry could make a record trip on the Arctic with ice dogs, one ought, surely, with equally good tackle, to be able to beat Perry's record on the splendidly even surface of the barrier. There must be some misunderstanding or other at the bottom of the Englishman's estimate of the Eskimo's dog utility in the polar regions. Can it be that the dog has not understood his master, or is it the master who has not understood his dog? The right footing must be established from the outset. The dog must understand that he has to obey in everything, and the master must know how to make himself respected. If obedience is once established, I am convinced that the dog will be superior to all other draught animals over these long distances. Another very important reason for using the dog is that this small creature can much more easily cross the numerous slight snow bridges that are not to be avoided on the barrier and on the glaciers. If a dog falls into a crevice, there is no great harm done. A tug at his harness, and he is out again. But it is another matter with a pony. This comparatively large and heavy animal, of course, falls through far more easily, and if this happens, it is a long and stiff job to get the beast hauled up again. Unless, indeed, the traces have broken, and the pony lies at the bottom of a crevice one thousand feet deep. And then there is the obvious advantage, that the dog can be fed on dog. One can reduce one's pack little by little, slaughtering the feebler ones and feeding the chosen with them. In this way they get fresh meat. Our dogs lived on dog's flesh and pemmican the whole way, and this enabled them to do splendid work. And if we ourselves wanted a piece of fresh meat, we could cut off a delicate little fillet. It tasted to us as good as the best beef. The dogs do not object at all. As long as they get their share, they do not mind what part of their comrade's carcass it comes from. All that was left after one of these canine meals was the teeth of the victim, and if it had been a really hard day, these also disappeared. If we take a step further from the barrier to the plateau, it would seem that every doubt of the dog's superiority must disappear. Not only can one get the dogs up over the huge glaciers that lead to the plateau, but one can make full use of them the whole way. Ponies, on the other hand, have to be left at the foot of the glacier, while the men themselves have the doubtful pleasure of acting as ponies. As I understand Shackleton's account, there can be no question of hauling the ponies over the steep and crevassed glaciers. It must be rather hard to have to abandon one's motive power voluntarily when only a quarter of the distance has been covered. I, for my part, prefer to use it all the way. From the very beginning I saw that the first part of our expedition, from Norway to the barrier, would be the most dangerous section. If we could only reach the barrier with our dogs safe and well, the future would be bright enough. Fortunately, all my comrades took the same view of the matter, and with their cooperation we succeeded, not only in bringing the dogs safely to our field of operations, but in landing them in far better condition than we had received them. Their number was also considerably increased on the way, which seems to be another proof of a flourishing state of things. To protect them against damp and heat, we laid a loose deck of planed boards about three inches above the fixed deck, an arrangement by which all the rain and spray ran underneath the dogs. In this way we kept them out of the water, which must always be running from side to side on the deck of a deep-laden vessel on her way to the Antarctic Ocean. 
Going through the tropics, this loose deck did double service. It always afforded a somewhat cool surface, as there was a fresh current of air between the two decks. The main deck, which was black with tar, would have been unbearably hot for the animals. The false deck was high and kept fairly white during the whole voyage. We carried awnings in addition, chiefly on account of the dogs. These awnings could be stretched over the whole vessel and give the dogs constant protection from the burning sun. I still cannot help smiling when I think of the compassionate voices that were raised here and there, and even made their way into print, about the cruelty to animals on board the Fram. Presumably, these cries came from tender-hearted individuals who themselves kept watchdogs tied up. Besides our four-footed companions, we took with us a two-footed one, not so much on account of the serious work on the polar regions as for pleasant entertainment on the way. This was our canary, Fritjof. It was one of the many presents made to the expedition, and not the least welcome of them. It began to sing as soon as it came on board, and has now kept it going on two circumnavigations through the most inhospitable waters of the earth. It probably holds the record as a polar traveller among its kind. Later on we had a considerable collection of various families, pigs, fowls, sheep, cats, and rats yes unfortunately we knew what it was to have rats on board the most repulsive of all creatures and the worst vermin i know of but we have declared war against them and off they shall go before the fram starts on her next voyage we got them in bonus errors and the best thing will be to bury them in their native land on account of the rather straitened circumstances the expedition had to contend with i had to look twice at every shilling before i spent it Articles of clothing are an important factor in a polar expedition, and I consider it necessary that the expedition should provide each of its members with the actual polar clothing. If one left this part of the equipment to each individual, I am afraid things would look badly before the journey was done. I must admit that there was some temptation to do this. It would have been very much cheaper if I had simply given each man a list of what clothes he was required to provide for himself but by so doing I should have missed the opportunity of personally supervising the quality of the clothing to the extent I desired. It was not an outfit that cut a dash by its appearance, but it was warm and strong. From the commiserate stores at Horton I obtained many excellent articles. I owe Captain Pedersen, the present chief of the commiserate department, my heartiest thanks for the courtesy he has always showed me when I came to get things out of him. Through him I had about two hundred blankets served out to me. Now the reader must not imagine a bed and bedding, such as he may see exhibited in the windows of furniture shops with thick white blankets, so delicate that in spite of their thickness they look as if they might float away of their own accord. So light and fine do they appear. It was not blankets like these that Captain Pedersen gave us. We should not have known what to do with them if he had. The blankets the commissariat gave us were of an entirely different sort. As to their colour, well, I can only call it indeterminable. And they did not give one the impression that they would float away either if one let go of them. No, they would keep on the ground right enough. They were felted and pressed together into a thick hard mass. From the dawn of time they had served our brave warriors at sea and it is by no means impossible that some of them had gruesome stories to tell of the days of Torgent's cold. The first thing I did, on obtaining possession of these treasures, was to get them into the dying vat. They were unrecognisable when we got them back, in ultramarine blue, or whatever it is called. The metamorphosis was complete, their warlike past was wiped out. My intention was to have these two hundred blankets made into polar clothing, and I took counsel with myself how I might get this done. To disclose the origin of the stuff would be an unfortunate policy. No tailor in the world would make clothes out of old blankets. I was pretty sure of that. I had to hit upon some stratagem. I heard of a man who was a capable worker at his trade, and asked him to come and see me. My office looked exactly like a woollen warehouse, with blankets everywhere. The tailor arrived. Was that the stuff? Yes, that was it, just imported from abroad, a great bargain, a lot of samples, dirt cheap. I had put on my most innocent and unconcerned expression. I saw the tailor glance at me sideways. I suppose he thought the samples were rather large. A closely woven stuff, said he, 
holding it up to the light. I could almost swear it was felted. We went carefully through every single sample and took the number. It was a long and tedious business, and I was glad when I saw that at last we were nearing the end. Over in a corner there lay a few more. We had reached the one hundred and ninety-third, so there could not be many in the pile. I was occupied with something else, and the tailor went through the remainder by himself. I was just congratulating myself on the apparently fortunate result of the morning's work, when I was startled by an exclamation from the man in the corner. It sounded like the bellow of a mad bull. Alas! there stood the tailor, enveloped in ultramarine and swinging over his head a blanket, the colour changent of which left no doubt as to the origin of the directly imported goods. With a look of thunder the man quitted me, and I sank in black despair. I never saw him again. The fact was that in my hurry I had forgotten the sample blanket that Captain Pedersen had sent me. That was the cause of the catastrophe. Well, I finally succeeded in getting the work executed, and it is certain that no expedition has ever had warmer and stronger clothing than this. It was a great favour on board. I also thought it best to provide good oilskins and especially good sea boots for every man. The sea boots were therefore made to measure, and of the very best material. I had them made by the firm I have always regarded as the best in that branch. How then shall I describe our grief when, on the day we were to wear our beautiful sea boots, we discovered that most of them were useless? Some of the men could dance a hornpipe in theirs without taking the boots off their deck. Others, by exerting all their strength, could not squeeze their foot through the narrow way and reach paradise. The leg was so narrow that even the most delicate little foot could not get through it and to make up for this the foot of the boot was so huge that it could comfortably accommodate twice as much as its owner could show very few were able to wear their boots we tried changing but that was no use the boots were not made for any creatures of this planet but sailors are sailors wherever they may be and it is not easy to beat them most of them knew the proverb that one pair of boots that fit is better than ten pairs that you can't put on and had brought their own with them, and so we got out of that difficulty. We took three sets of linen underclothing for every man to wear in the warm regions. This part of the equipment was left to each individual. Most men possess a few old shirts, and not much more is wanted through the tropics. For the cold regions there were two sets of extra thick woollen underclothing, two thick hand-knitted woollen jerseys, six pairs of knitted stockings, Iceland and other lighter jackets, socks and stockings from the penitentiary. Besides these, we had a quantity of clothing from the army depots. I owe many thanks to General Kilho for the kind way in which he fell in with all my wishes. From this quarter we obtained outer clothing for cold and warm climates, underclothes, boots, shoes, wind clothing, and cloths of different kinds. As the last item of our personal equipment, I may mention that each man had a suit of sealskin from Greenland. Then there were such things as darning wool, sewing yarn, needles of all possible sizes, buttons, scissors, tapes, broad and narrow, black and white, blue and red. I may safely assert that nothing was forgotten. We were well and amply equipped in every way. Another side of our preparations which claimed some attention was the fitting up of the quarters we were to inhabit the saloons and the cabins. What an immense difference it makes if one lives in comfortable surroundings. For my part, I can do twice the amount of work when I see tidiness and comfort around me. The saloons on the Fram were very handsomely and tastefully fitted. Here we owe, in the first place, our respectful thanks to King Hakon and Queen Maud for the photographs they presented to us. They were the most precious of our gifts. The ladies of Horton gave us a number of pretty things for decorating the cabins, and they will no doubt be glad to hear of the admiration they aroused wherever we went. "'Is this really a polar ship?' people asked. "'We expected to see nothing but wooden benches and bare walls.' And they began to talk about boudoirs and that sort of thing. Besides splendid embroideries, our walls were decorated with the most wonderful photographs. It would have rejoiced the giver of these to hear all the words of praise that have been bestowed upon them. The sleeping quarters I left to individual taste. Every man could take a bit of his home in his own little compartment. The bedclothes came from the naval factory at Horton. 
They were first-class work, like everything else that came from there. We owe our best thanks to the giver of the soft blankets that have so often been our joy and put warmth into us after a bitter day. They came from a woollen mill in Trondheim. I must also mention our paper supply, which was in all respects as fine and elegant as it could possibly be. The most exquisite note paper, stamped with a picture of the Fram and the name of the expedition, in large and small size, broad and narrow, old style and new style, every kind of note paper, in fact, of pens and pen holders, pencils, black and coloured, India rubber, Indian ink, drawing pins and other kinds of pins, ink and ink powder, white chalk and red chalk, gum arabic and other gums, date holders and almanacs, ship's logs and private diaries notebooks and sledging diaries, and many other things of the same sort. We have such a stock that we shall be able to circumnavigate the earth several times more before running short. This gift does honour to the firm which sent it. Every time I have sent a letter or written in my diary, I have had a grateful thought for the givers. From one of the largest houses in Christiana, we had a complete set of kitchen utensils and breakfast and dinner services, of all the best kind. The cups, plates, knives, forks, spoons, jugs, glasses, etc., were all marked with the ship's name. We carried an extraordinary copious library. Presents of books were showered upon us in great quantities. I suppose the Fram's library at the present moment contains at least three thousand volumes. For our entertainment we also had a good many different games. One of these became our favourite pastime in leisure evenings down in the south. Packs of cards we had by the dozen, and many of them have already been well used. A gramophone, with a large supply of records, was, I think, our best friend. Of musical instruments we had a piano, a violin, a flute, mandolins, not forgetting a mouth-organ and an accordion. All the publishers had been kind enough to send us music so that we could cultivate this art as much as we wished. Christmas presents streamed in from all sides. I suppose we had about five hundred on board. Christmas trees and decorations for them, with many other things to amuse us at Christmas, were sent with us by friends and acquaintances. People have indeed been kind to us, and I can assure the givers that all their presents have been, and are still, much appreciated. We were well supplied with wines and spirits, thanks to one of the largest firms of wine merchants in Christiana. An occasional glass of wine or a tot of spirits were things that we all, without exception, were very glad of. The question of alcohol on polar expeditions has often been discussed. Personally, I regard alcohol, used in moderation, as a medicine in the polar regions. I mean, of course, so long as one is in winter quarters. It is another matter on sledge journeys. There we all know from experience that alcohol must be banished. Not because a drink of spirits can do any harm, but on account of the weight and space. On sledging journeys one has, of course, to save weight as much as possible, and to take only what is strictly necessary. And I do not include alcohol under the head of strictly necessary things. Nor was it only in winter quarters that we had use for alcohol, but also on the long, monotonous voyage through raw, cold and stormy regions. A tot of spirits is often a very good thing when one goes below after a bitter watch on deck and is just turning in. A total abstainer will no doubt turn up his nose and ask whether a cup of good warm coffee would not do as well. For my part, I think the quantity of coffee people pour into themselves at such times is far more harmful than a little Lysoma snaps. And think of the important part a glass of wine or toddy plays in social gatherings on such a voyage. Two men have fallen out a little in the course of the week, are reconciled at once by the scent of rum. The past is forgiven, and they start afresh in friendly cooperation. Take alcohol away from these little festivities, and you will soon see the difference. It is a sad thing. Someone will say that men absolutely must have alcohol to put them in a good humour. And I am quite ready to agree. But seeing that our nature is what it is, we must try to make the best of it. It seems as though we civilised human beings must have stimulating drinks. And that being so, we have to follow our own convictions. I am for a glass of toddy. Let who will eat plum cake and swill hot coffee. Heartburn and other troubles are often the result of this kind of refreshment. A little toddy doesn't hurt anybody. The consumption of alcohol on the Fram's third voyage was as follows. One dram and fifteen drops at dinner on Wednesdays and Sundays, and a glass of toddy on Saturday evenings. 
On holidays there was an additional allowance. We were all well supplied with tobacco and cigars from various firms at home and abroad. We had enough cigars to allow us one each on Saturday evenings and after dinner on Sundays. Two Christiana manufacturers sent us their finest bonbons and drops, and a foreign firm gave us gala pita, so that it was no rare thing to see the polar explorers helping themselves to a sweet meat or a piece of chocolate. An establishment at Dremmen gave us as much fruit syrup as we could drink, and if the giver only knew how many times we blessed the excellent product he supplied, I am sure he would be pleased. On the homeward march from the Pole we looked forward every day to getting nearer to our supply of syrup. From three different firms in Christiana we received all our requirements in the way of cheese, biscuits, tea, sugar and coffee. The packing of the last named was so efficient that although the coffee was roasted, it is still as fresh and aromatic as the day it left the warehouse. Another firm sent us soap enough for five years, and one uses a good deal of that commodity even on a polar voyage. A man in Christiana had seen to the care of our skin, hair and teeth, and it is not his fault if we have not delicate skins, abundant growth of hair and teeth like pearls, for the outfit was certainly complete enough. An important item of the equipment is the medical department, and here my advisers were Dr. Jacob Roll and Dr. Holth. Therefore, nothing was wanting. A chemist in Christiana supplied all the necessary medicines as a contribution, carefully chosen and beautifully arranged. Unfortunately, no doctor accompanied the expedition, so that I was obliged to take all the responsibility myself. Lieutenant Jertsen, who had a pronounced aptitude both for drawing teeth and amputating legs, went through a lightning course at the hospital and the dental hospital. He clearly showed that much may be learnt in a short time by giving one's mind to it. With surprising rapidity and apparent confidence, Lieutenant Gertsen disposed of the most complicated cases, whether invariably to the patient's advantage is another question, which I shall leave undecided. He drew teeth with a dexterity that strongly reminded one of the conjurer's art. One moment he showed an empty pair of forceps, the next there was a big molar in their grip. The yells one heard while the operation was in progress seemed to indicate that it was not entirely painless. A match factory gave us all the safety matches we wanted. They were packed so securely that we could quite well have towed the cases after us in the sea all the way, and found the matches perfectly dry on arrival. We had a quantity of ammunition and explosives. As the whole of the lower hold was full of petroleum, the Fram had a rather dangerous cargo on board. We therefore took all possible precautions against fire. Extinguishing apparatus was fitted in every cabin, and wherever practicable, and pumps with hose were always in readiness on deck. The necessary ice tools, such as saws from two to six metres long, ice drills, etc., were not forgotten. We had a number of scientific instruments with us. Professors Nansen and Helen Hansen had devoted many an hour to our oceanographical equipment, which was therefore a model of what such an equipment should be. Lieutenants Prestrud and Jertsen had both gone through the necessary course in oceanography under Helen Hansen at the Bergen Biological Station. I myself had spent a summer there and taken part in one of the oceanographical courses. Professor Helen Hansen was a brilliant teacher. I am afraid I cannot assert that I was an equally brilliant pupil. Professor Mon had given us a complete meteorological outfit. Among the instruments belonging to the Fram I may mention a pendulum apparatus, an excellent astronomical theodolite and a sextant. Lieutenant Prestrud studied the use of the pendulum apparatus under Professor Schultz, and the use of the astronomical theodolite under Professor Gilmiden. We had an additional several sextants and artificial horizons, both glass and mercury. We had binoculars of all sizes, from the largest to the smallest. End of section 5 Recording by Martina, Sydney, Australia Section 6 of the South Pole this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jer, Folly Beach, South Carolina. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 6, Volume 1, Chapter 2. Plan and Preparations, Part 3. So far I have been dealing with our general outfit, and shall now pass to the special equipment of the shore party. The hut we took out was built on my property on Bundefjord, so that I was able to watch the work as it progressed. It was built by the brothers Hans and Jorgen Stuberud, and was throughout a splendid piece of work, which did honor to both the brothers. The materials prove excellent in every way. The hut was twenty-six feet long by thirteen feet wide, its height from the floor to the ridge of the roof was about twelve feet. It was built as an ordinary Norwegian house with pointed gable and had two rooms. One of these was nineteen and a half feet long and was to serve as our dormitory, dining room, and sitting room. The other room was six and a half feet long and was to be Lindstrom's kitchen. From the kitchen a double trap door led to the loft where we intended to keep a quantity of provisions and outfit. The walls consisted of three-inch planks, with air spaces between, panels outside and inside with air spaces between them and the plank walling. For insulation we used cellulose pulp. The floor and the ceiling between the rooms and the loft were double, while the upper room was single. The doors were extraordinarily thick and strong, and fitted into oblique grooves, so that they closed very tightly. There were two windows a triple one in the end wall of the main room, and a double one in the kitchen. For the covering of the roof we took out roofing paper, and for the floor linoleum. In the main room there were two air pipes, one to admit fresh air, and the other for the exhaust. There were bunks for ten men in two stages, six on one wall and four on the other. The furniture of the room consisted of a table, a stool for each man, and a lux lamp. One half of the kitchen was occupied by the range, the other by shelves and cooking utensils. The hut was tarred several times, and every part was carefully marked so that it could easily be set up. To fasten it to the ground and prevent the Antarctic storms from blowing it away, I had strong eye bolts screwed into each end of the roof ridge and the four corners of the roof. We carried six strong eye bolts, a meter long, to be rammed into the barrier, between these bolts and those on the hut steel wires were to be stretched, which could be drawn quite tight. We also had two spare cables, which could be stretched over the roof if the gales were too severe. The two ventilating pipes and the chimney were secured outside with strong stays. As will be seen, every precaution was taken to make the hut warm and comfortable, and to hold it down on the ground. We also took on board a quantity of loose timber, boards, and planks. Besides the hut, we took with us fifteen tents for sixteen men each. Ten of these were old but good. They were served out to us from the naval stores. The other five were new, and we bought them from the army depots. It was our intention to use the tents as temporary houses. They were easily and quickly set up, and were strong and warm. On the voyage to the south, Roan sewed new floors of good strong canvas to the five new tents. All cases of provisions that were intended for winter quarters were marked and stowed separately in the hold in such a way that they could be put out on the ice at once. We had ten sledges made by a firm of sporting outfitters in Christiana. They were built like the old Nansen sledges, but rather broader and were twelve feet long. The runners were of the best American hickory shod with steel. The other parts were of good tough Norwegian ash. To each sledge belonged a pair of spare runners, which could easily be fitted underneath by means of clamps, and as easily removed when not required. The steel shoeing of the runners was well coated with red lead, and the spare runners with tar. These sledges were extremely strongly built, and could stand all kinds of work on every sort of surface. At that time I did not know the conditions on the barrier as I afterwards came to know them. Of course, these sledges were very heavy. We took twenty pairs of ski, all of the finest hickory. They were eight feet long and proportionately narrow. I chose them of this length with a view to being able to cross the numerous cracks in the glaciers. 
The greater the surface over which the weight could be distributed, the better prospect we should have of slipping over the snow bridges. We had forty ski poles with ebonite points. The ski bindings were a combination of the Huitfeld and the Hoyer Ellefson bindings. We also had quantities of loose straps. We had six three man tents, all made in the Navy workshops. The workmanship could not have been better. They were the strongest and most practical tents that have ever been used. They were made of the closest canvas, with the floor in one piece. One man was sufficient to set up the tent in the stiffest breeze. I have come to the conclusion that the fewer poles a tent has, the easier it is to set up, which seems quite natural. These tents have only one pole. How often one reads in narratives of polar travel that it took such and such a time, often hours, to set up the tent and then, when at last it was up, one lay expecting it to be blown down at any moment. There was no question of this with our tents. They were up in a twinkling and stood against all kinds of wind. We could lie securely in our sleeping bags and let it blow. The arrangement of the door was on the usual sack principle, which is now recognized as the only serviceable one for the polar regions. The sack patent is quite simple, like all patents that are any good. Not a particle of snow can get into a tent with this floor sewed on and an entrance of this kind, even in the worst storm. The cases for sledging provisions were made of fairly thin, tough ash, which came from the estate of Palsgaard in Jutland, and the material did all it promised. These cases were one foot square and fifteen and a half inches high. They had only a little round opening on the top, closed with an aluminum lid, which fitted exactly like the lid of a milk can. Large lids weakened the cases, and I had therefore chosen this form. We did not have to throw off the lashing of the case to get the lid off, and this is a very great advantage. We could always get at it. A case with a large lid, covered by the lashing, gives constant trouble. The whole lashing has to be undone for every little thing one wants out of the case. This is not always convenient. If one is tired and slack, it may sometimes happen that one will put off till tomorrow what ought to be done today especially when it is bitterly cold. The handier one's sledging outfit, the sooner one gets into the tent and to rest, and that is no small consideration on a long journey. Our outfit of clothing was abundant and more complete, I suppose, than that of any former polar expedition. We may divide it into two classes, the outfit for specially low temperatures and that for more moderate temperatures. It must be remembered that no one had yet wintered on the barrier, so we had to be prepared for anything. In order to be able to grapple with any degree of cold, we were supplied with the richest assortment of reindeer skin clothing. We had it specially thick, medium, and quite light. It took a long time to get these skin clothes prepared. First the reindeer skins had to be bought in a raw state, and this was done for me by Mr. Zapfa at Tromso, Karisrok, and Kato Kaino. Let me take the opportunity of thanking this man for the many and great services he has rendered me, not only during my preparations for the third voyage of the Fram, but in the fitting out of the Gyoa expedition as well. With his help I have succeeded in obtaining things that I should otherwise never have been able to get. He shrank from no amount of work, but went on till he had found what I wanted. This time he procured nearly two hundred and fifty good reindeer skins, dressed by the laps, and sent them to Christiana. Here I had great trouble in finding a man who could sew skins, but at last I found one. We then went to work to make clothes after the pattern of the Nacelli Eskimo, and the sewing went on early and late. Thick anoraks and thin ones, heavy breeches and light, winter stockings and summer stockings. We also had a dozen thin sleeping bags, which I thought of using inside the big thick ones if the cold should be too severe. Everything was finished, but not until the last moment. The outer sleeping bags were made by Mr. Bront, furrier of Bergen, and they were so excellent, both in material and making up, that no one in the world could have done better. It was a model piece of work. To save this outer sleeping bag, we had it provided with a cover of the lightest canvas, which was a good deal longer than the bag itself. It was easy to tie the end of the cover together like the mouth of the sack, and this kept the snow out of the bag during the day's march. In this way, we always kept ourselves free from the annoyance of drifting snow. 
We attached great importance to having the bags made of the very best sort of skin, and took care that the thin skin of the belly was removed. I have seen sleeping bags of the finest reindeer skin spoilt on a comparatively short time if they contained a few patches of this thin skin, as of course the cold penetrates more easily through the thin skin, and gives rise to dampness in the form of rime on meeting the warmth of the body. These thin patches remain damp whenever one is in the bag, and in a short time they lose their hair. The damp spreads, like decay in wood, and continually attacks the surrounding skin, with the result that one fine day you find yourself with a hairless sleeping bag. One cannot be too careful in the choice of skins. For the sake of economy, the makers of reindeer skin sleeping bags are in the habit of sewing them in such a way that the direction of the hair is towards the opening of the bag. Of course, this suits the shape of the skins best, but it does not suit the man who is going to use the bag, for it is no easy matter to crawl into a sleeping bag which is only just wide enough to allow one to get in, and if the way of the hair is against one, it is doubly difficult. I had them all made as one-man bags, with lacing round the neck. This did not, of course, meet with the approval of all, as will be seen later. The upper part of this thick sleeping bag was made of thinner reindeer skin, so that we might be able to tie it closely round the neck. The thick skin will not draw so well and fit so closely as the thin. Our clothing in moderate temperatures consisted of thick woolen underclothing and Burberry windproof overalls. This underclothing was specially designed for the purpose. I had myself watched the preparation of the material and knew that it contained nothing but pure wool. We had overalls of two different materials, Burberry gabardine and the ordinary green kind that is used in Norway in the winter. For sledge journeys, where one has to save weight and to work in loose, easy garments, I must unhesitatingly recommend Burberry. It is extraordinarily light and strong, and keeps the wind completely out. For hard work, I prefer the green kind. It keeps out the wind equally well, but is heavier and more bulky, and less comfortable to wear on a long march. Our Burberry wind clothes were made in the form of anorak, blouse, and trousers, both very roomy. The others consisted of trousers and jacket with hood. Our mitts were for the most part such as one can buy in any shop. We wanted nothing else in and around winter quarters. Outside the mitts we wore an outer covering of windproof material so as not to wear them out too quickly. These mitts are not very strong, though they are good and warm. Besides these, we had ten pairs of ordinary kid mitts, which were bought at a glove shop in Christiana, and were practically impossible to wear out. I wore mine from Fraunheim to the Pole and back again, and afterwards on the voyage to Tasmania. The lining, of course, was torn in places, but the seams of the mitts were just as perfect as the day I bought them. Taking into consideration the fact that I went on ski the whole way and used two poles, it will be understood that the mitts were strongly made, we also had a number of woolen gloves, which, curiously enough, the others greatly prized. For myself, I was never able to wear such things. They simply freeze the fingers off me. But most important of all is the covering of the feet, for the feet are the most exposed members and the most difficult to protect. One can look after the hands. If they grow cold, it is easy to beat them into warmth again. Not so with the feet. They are covered up in the morning and this is a sufficiently troublesome piece of work to make one disinclined to do it again until one is turning in. They cannot be seen in the course of the day, and one has to depend entirely on feeling, but feeling in this case often plays curious tricks. How often it has happened that men have had their feet frozen off without knowing it, for if they had known it, they could not possibly have let it go so far. The fact is that in this case sensation is a somewhat doubtful guide, for the feet lose all sensation. It is true that there is a transitional stage when one feels the cold smarting in one's toes and tries to get rid of it by stamping the feet. As a rule, this is successful. The warmth returns or the circulation is restored, but it occasionally happens that sensation is lost at the very moment when these precautions are taken. And then, one must be an old hand to know what has happened. Many men conclude that, as they no longer feel the unpleasant smarting sensation, all is well. And at the evening inspection, a frozen foot of tallow-like appearance presents itself. An event of this kind may ruin the most elaborately prepared enterprise, 
and it is therefore advisable in the matter of feet to carry one's caution to lengths which may seem ridiculous. Now, it is a fact that if one can wear soft footgear exclusively, the risk of frostbite is far less than if one is compelled to wear stiff boots. In soft footgear, of course, the foot can move far more easily and keep warm, but we were to take ski and to get full use out of them, so that in any case we had to have a stiff sole for the sake of the bindings. It is of no use to have a good binding unless you can use it in the right way. In my opinion, on a long journey such as that we had before us, the ski must be perfectly steady. I do not know anything that tires me more than a bad fastening, that is, one that allows the foot to shift in the binding. I want the ski to be a part of oneself, so that one always has full command of them. I have tried many patents, for I have always been afraid of a stiff fastening in cold temperatures, but all these patents, without exception, are worthless in the long run. I decided this time to try a combination of stiff and soft footgear, so that we could use the splendid Hutfield Hoyer Ellefson bindings. But this was no easy matter. Of our whole outfit, nothing caused me more worry or gave us all more work in the course of the expedition than the stiff outer covering which we had to have. But we solved the problem at last. I applied to one of the leading makers of ski boots in Christiana and explained the difficulty to him. Fortunately, I had found a man who was evidently interested in the question. We agreed that he should make a sample pair after the pattern of ski boots. The sole was to be thick and stiff, for we had to be prepared to use crampons, but the uppers as soft as possible. In order to avoid leather, which usually becomes stiff and easily cracked in the cold, he was to use a combination of leather and thin canvas for the uppers, leather nearest the sole and canvas above it. The measurements were taken from my foot, which is not exactly a child's foot, with two pairs of reindeer skin stockings on, and ten pairs were made. I well remember seeing those boots in civilized Christiana. They were exhibited in the bootmaker's windows. I used to go a long way around to avoid coming face to face with these monsters in public. We are all a trifle vain, and dislike having our own shortcomings shown up in electric light. If I had ever cherished any illusions on the subject of a dainty little foot, I am sure the last trace of such vanity died out on the day I passed the shoemaker's window and beheld my own boots. I never went that way again until I was certain that the exhibition was closed. One thing is certain, that the boots were a fine piece of workmanship. We shall hear later on of the alterations they had to undergo before we at last made them as large as we wanted, for the giant boots turned out much too small. Among other equipment, I must mention our excellent Primus cooking apparatus. This all came complete from a firm in Stockholm. For cooking on sledge journeys, the Primus stove ranks above all others. It gives a great deal of heat, uses little oil, and requires no attention. Advantages which are important enough anywhere, but especially when sledging. There is never any trouble with this apparatus. It has come as near perfection as possible. We took five Nansen cookers with us. The cooker utilizes the heat more completely than any other, but I have one objection to make to it. It takes up space. We used it on our depot journeys, but were unfortunately obliged to give it up on the main southern journey. We were so many in a tent, and space was so limited that I dared not risk using it. If one has room enough, it is ideal in my opinion. We had with us ten pairs of snowshoes and one hundred sets of dog harness of the Alaska Eskimo pattern. The Alaska Eskimo drive their dogs in tandem. The whole pull is thus straight ahead in the direction the sledge is going, and this is undoubtedly the best way of utilizing the power. I had made up my mind to adopt the same system in sledging on the barrier. Another great advantage it had was that the dogs would pass singly across fissures, so that the danger of falling through was considerably reduced. The exertion of pulling is also less trying with Alaska harness, than with the Greenland kind, as the Alaska harness has a shallow padded collar which is slipped over the animal's head and makes the weight of the pull come on his shoulders, whereas the Greenland harness presses on his chest. Raw places which occur rather frequently with the Greenland harness are almost entirely avoided with the other. All the sets of harness were made in the Navy workshops, and after their long and hard use they are as good as ever.
there could be no better recommendation than this. Of instruments and apparatus for the sledge journeys, we carried two sextants, three artificial horizons, of which two were glass horizons with dark glasses, and one a mercury horizon, and four spirit compasses, made in Christiana. They were excellent little compasses, but unfortunately useless in cold weather, that is to say, when the temperature went below minus forty degrees Fahrenheit. At this point the liquid froze. I had drawn the maker's attention to this beforehand, and asked him to use as pure a spirit as possible. What his object was I still do not know, but the spirit he employed was highly dilute. The best proof of this was that the liquid in our compasses froze before the spirits in a flask. We were naturally inconvenienced by this. Besides these we had an ordinary little pocket compass, two pairs of binoculars, one by Zeiss and the other by Gortz, and snow goggles from Dr. Schantz. We had various kinds of glasses for these, so that we could change when we were tired of one color. During the whole stay on the barrier, I myself wore a pair of ordinary spectacles with yellow glasses of quite a light tint. These are prepared by a chemical process in such a way that they nullify the harmful colors of the sun's rays. How excellent these glasses are appears clearly enough from the fact that I never had the slightest touch of snow blindness on the southern journey, although the spectacles were perfectly open and allowed the light to enter freely everywhere. It will perhaps be suggested that I am less susceptible to this ailment than others, but I know from personal experience that such is not the case. I have previously had several severe attacks of snow blindness. We had two photographic cameras, an air thermometer, two aneroids with altitude scale to 15,000 feet, and two hypsometers. The hypsometer is only an instrument for determining the boiling point, which gives one the height above the sea. The method is both simple and reliable. The medical stores for sledging were given by a London firm, and the way in which the things were packed speaks for the whole outfit. There is not a speck of rust on needles, scissors, knives, or anything else, although they have been exposed to much damp. Our own medical outfit, which was bought in Christiana, and according to the vendor's statement unusually well packed, became in a short time so damaged that the whole of it is now entirely spoiled. The sledging provisions must be mentioned briefly. I have already spoken of the pemmican. I have never considered it necessary to take a whole grocer's shop with me when sledging. The food should be simple and nourishing, and that is enough. A rich and varied menu is for people who have no work to do. Besides the pemmican, we had biscuits, milk powder, and chocolate. The biscuits were a present from a well-known Norwegian factory, and did all honor to their origin. They were specially baked for us, and were made of oatmeal with the addition of dried milk and a little sugar. They were extremely nourishing and pleasant to the taste. Thanks to efficient packing, they kept fresh and crisp all the time. These biscuits formed a great part of our daily diet, and undoubtedly contributed in no small degree to the successful result. Milk powder is a comparatively new commodity with us, but it deserves to be better known. It came from the district of Yederen. Neither heat nor cold, dryness nor wet could hurt it. We had large quantities of it lying out in small, thin linen bags in every possible state of the weather. The powder was as good the last day as the first. We also took dry milk from a firm in Wisconsin. This milk had an addition of malt and sugar, and was, in my opinion, excellent. It also kept good the whole time. The chocolate came from a world-renowned firm and was beyond all praise. The whole supply was a very acceptable gift. We are bringing all the purveyors of our sledging provisions samples of their goods that have made the journey to the South Pole and back, in gratitude for the kind assistance they afforded us. End of section 6, end of chapter 2, Plan and Preparations. Recording by Jer, Folly Beach, South Carolina. Seven of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Bell. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 7, Volume 1, 
Chapter 3 On the Way to the South, Part 1 The month of May, 1910, ran its course, beautiful only as a spring month in Norway can be. A lovely dream of verdure and flowers, but unfortunately we had little time to admire all the splendor that surrounded us. Our watchword was away. Away from beautiful sights as quickly as possible. From the beginning of the month the Fram lay moored to her buoy outside the old walls of Akers. Fresh and trim she came from the yard at Horton. You could see the shine on her new paint a long way off. Involuntarily one thought of holidays and yachting tours at the sight of her but the thought was soon banished. The first day after her arrival, the vessel's deck assumed the most everyday appearance that could be desired. The loading had begun. A long procession of cases and provisions made its way unceasingly from the basement of the historical museum down into the roomy hold of the Fram, where Lieutenant Nilsen and the three Norlanders were ready to receive them. The process was not an altogether simple one, on the contrary. It was a very serious affair. It was not enough to know that all the cases were duly on board. The problem was to know exactly where each particular case was placed, and, at the same time, to stow them all in such a way that they could be easily got at in the future. This was a difficult piece of work, and it was not rendered any more easy by the attention that had to be paid to the numerous hatches leading down into the lower hold, where the big petroleum tanks stood. All these hatches had to be left accessible, otherwise we should have been cut off from pumping the oil into the engine room. However, Nilsen and his assistants accomplished their task with brilliant success. Among the hundreds of cases, there was not one that was misplaced, not one that was stowed so that could not instantly be brought into the light of day. While the provisioning was going on, the rest of the equipment was also taken on board. Each member of the expedition was busily engaged in looking after the needs of his own department in the best way possible. Nor was this a question of trifles. One may cudgel one's brains endlessly in advance, but some new requirement will constantly be cropping up, until one puts a full stop to it by casting off and sailing. The event was becoming imminent, and the arrival of June. The day before leaving the Christiana, we had the honor and pleasure of receiving a visit from the King and Queen of Norway, on board the Fram. Having been informed beforehand of their Majesty's coming, we endeavored as far as possible to bring some order into the chaos that reigned on board. I do not know that we were particularly successful, but I am sure that every one of the Fram's crew will always remember, with respectful gratitude, King Hakon's cordial words of farewell. On the same occasion, the expedition received from their majesties the gift of a beautiful silver jug, which afterwards formed the most handsome ornament of our table on every festive occasion. On June 3rd, early in the forenoon, the Fram left Christiana bound at first for my home in Bundford. The object of her call there was to take on board the house for the winter station, which stood readily built in the garden. Our excellent carpenter, Jorgen Studdard, had superintended the construction of this strong building. It was now rapidly taken to pieces, and every single plank and beam was carefully numbered. We had quite an imposing pile of materials to get aboard, when even there was not so much room to spare. The bulk of it was stored forward, and the remainder in the hold. The more experienced among the members of the expedition were evidently absorbed in profound conjectures as to the meaning of this observation house, as the newspapers had christened it. It may willingly be admitted that they had good reason for their speculations. By an observation house, it usually meant a comparatively simple construction, sufficient to provide the necessary shelter from wind and weather. Our house, on the other hand, was a model of solidity, with three double walls, a double roof, and floor. Its arrangements included ten inviting bunks, a kitchener, and a table. The latter, moreover, had a brand new American cloth cover. I can understand that they want to keep themselves warm when they are making observations, said Helmer Hansen. But what do they want with a cloth on the table I cannot make out. On the afternoon of June 6th it was announced that everything was ready, and in the evening we all assembled at a simple farewell supper in the garden. I took the opportunity of wishing good luck to every man in turn, and finally we united in 
God preserve the king and the fatherland. Then we broke up. The last man to get into the boat was the second in command. He arrived armed with a horseshoe. In his opinion, it is quite incredible what luck an old horseshoe will bring. Possibly he is right. Anyhow, the horseshoe was firmly nailed to the mast in the Fram saloon, and there it still hangs. When on board, we promptly set to work to get up the anchor. The Bolander motor hummed, and the heavy cable rattled in through the hawsey hole. Precisely at midnight, the anchor let go of the bottom, and just as the 7th of June rolled in over us, the Fram stood out of Christiana Ford for the third time. Twice already had a band of stout-hearted men brought the ship back with honor, after years of service. Would it be vouchsafed to us to uphold this honorable tradition? Such were, no doubt, the thoughts with which most of us were occupied, as our vessel glided over the motionless fjord in the light summer night. The start was made under the sign of the 7th of June, and this was taken as a promise omen. But among our bright and confident hopes, there crept a shadow of melancholy. The hillsides, the woods, the fjord, were so bewitchingly fair and so dear to us, they called to us with their allurement. But the diesel motor knew no pity. Its tough tough went on brutally through the stillness, a little boat in which some of my nearest relations dropped gradually astern. There was a glimpse of white handkerchiefs in the twilight, and then farewell. The next morning we were moored in the inner harbor at Horton. An apparently innocent lighter came alongside at once, but the lighter's cargo was not quite so innocent as its appearance. It consisted of no less than a half ton of gun cotton and rifle ammunition, a somewhat unpleasant but none the less necessary item of our equipment. Besides taking on board the ammunition, we availed ourselves of the opportunity of completing our water supply. When this was done, we lost no time in getting away. As we passed the warships lying in the harbor, they manned shipped, and the bands played the national anthem. Outside Velos, we had the pleasure of waving a last farewell to a man to whom the expedition will always owe a debt of gratitude, Captain Christian Blom, superintendent of the dockyard, who had supervised the extensive repairs to the Fram with unrelaxing interest and obligingness. He slipped past us in his sailing boat. I do not remember if he got a cheer. If he did not, it was a mistake. Now we are on our way to the south, as the heading of this chapter announces. Though not yet in earnest, we had an additional task before us, the oceanographical cruise in the Atlantic. This necessitated a considerable detour on the way. The scientific results of the cruise will be dealt with by specialists in due course. If it is briefly referred to here, this is chiefly for the sake of continuity. After consultation with Professor Nansen, the plan was to begin investigations in the region to the south of Ireland, and thence to work our way westward as far as time and circumstances permitted. The work was to be resumed on the homeward voyage in the direction of the north of Scotland. For various reasons, this program afterwards had to be considerably reduced. For the first few days after leaving Norway, we were favored with the most splendid summer weather. The North Sea was as calm as a mill pond, and the Fram had little more motion than when she was lying in Bumford. This was all the better for us, as we could hardly be said to be absolutely ready for sea when we passed Ferder, and came into the capricious Skagerjak. Hard pressed as we had been for time, it had not been possible to lash and stow the last of our cargo as securely as was desirable. A stiff breeze at the mouth of the fjord would therefore have been rather inconvenient. As it was, everything was arranged admirably, but to do this we had to work night and day. I have been told that on former occasions seasickness made fearful ravages on board the Fram, but from this trial we also had an easy escape. Nearly all the members of the expedition were used to the sea, and the few who perhaps were not so entirely proof against it had a whole week of fine weather to get into training. So far as I know, not a single case occurred of this unpleasant and justly dreadful complaint. After passing the Dogger Bank, we had a very welcome northeast breeze. With the help of the sails, we could now increase the not very reckless speed that the motor was capable of accomplishing. Before we sailed, the most contradictory accounts were current of the Fram's sailing qualities. There were some who asserted that the chip could not be got through the water at all, while with equal force the contrary view was maintained, that she was a notable fast sailer. 
As might be supposed, the truth, as usual, lay about halfway between these two extremes. The ship was no racer, nor was she an absolute log. We ran before the northeast wind towards the English Channel at a speed of about seven knots, and with that we were satisfied for the time being. The important question for us was whether we should keep the favorable wind till we were well through the Straits of Dover, and preferably a good way down the channel. Our engine power was far too limited to make it of any use trying to go against the wind, and we should have been obliged in that case to have recourse to the sailing ship's method, beating. Tacking in the English Channel, the busiest of the world's seas, is in itself not a very pleasant work. For us it would be so much the worse, as it would greatly encroach on the time that could be devoted to oceanographical investigations. But the east wind held with praiseworthy steadiness. In the course of a few days, we were through the channel, and about a week after leaving Norway, we were able to take the first oceanographical station at the point arranged according to the plan. Hitherto, everything had gone as smoothly as we could wish, but now, for a change, difficulties began to appear first in the form of unfavorable weather, when the northwester begins to blow in the North Atlantic, it is generally a good while before it drops again, and this time it did not belie its reputation. Far from getting to the westward, we were threatened for a time with being driven onto the Irish coast. It was not quite so bad as that, but we soon found ourselves obliged to shorten the route originally laid down very considerably. A contributing cause of this determination was the fact that the motor was out of order. Whether it was the fault of the oil, or a defect in the engine itself, our engineer was not clear. It was therefore necessary to make for home in good time, in case of extensions for repairs being required. In spite of these difficulties, we had quite a respectable collection of samples of water and temperature at different depths before we set our course for Norway at the beginning of July, with Bergen as our destination. During the passage from the Pentland Firth, we had a violent gale from the north, which gave us an opportunity of experiencing how the Fram behaved in bad weather. The trial was by no means an easy one. It was a blowing gale, with a cross sea. We kept going practically under full sail, and had the satisfaction of seeing our ship make over nine knots. In the rather severe rolling, the collar of the mast in the forecabin was loosened a little, this let the water in, and there was a slight flooding of Lieutenant Nilsen's cabin and mine. The others who burst were to port were on the weather side and kept dry. We came out of it all with the loss of a few boxes of cigars, which were wet through. They were not entirely lost for all that. Ronnie took charge of them and regaled himself with the salt and moldy cigars for six months afterwards. Going eight or nine knots an hour, we did not make much of the distance between Scotland and Norway. On the afternoon of Saturday, July 9th, the wind dropped, and at the same time the lookout reported land in sight. This was Sigan and Bomelo. In the course of the night we came under the coast, and on Sunday morning, July 10th, we ran into Seljansford. We had no detailed chart of this inlet, but after making a great noise with our powerful air siren, we at last roused the inmates of the pilot station, and a pilot came aboard. He showed visible signs of surprise when he found out by reading the name of the ship's side that it was the Fram he had before him. "'Lord, I thought you were a Russian,' he exclaimed. This supposition was presumably intended to serve as a sort of excuse for his small hurry in coming aboard. It was a lovely trip through the fjords to Bergen, as warm and pleasant in here as it had been bitter and cold outside. We had a dead calm all day, and with the four knots an hour, which was all the motor could manage, it was late in the evening when we anchored off the naval dockyard in Solmvist. Our stay in Pergen happened at the time of the expedition, and the committee paid the expedition the compliment of giving all its members free passes. Business of one kind or another compelled me to go to Christiana, leaving the Fram in charge of Lieutenant Nilsen. They had their hands more than full on board. Diesel's firm in Stockholm sent their experienced fitter, Aspelin, who at once set to work to overhaul the motor thoroughly. The work that had to be done was executed gratis by the Lexenvag Engineering Works. After going into the matter thoroughly, it was decided to change the solar oil we had on board for refined petroleum. Through the courtesy of the West of Norway Petroleum Company, we got this done on very favorable terms at the company's storage dock in Satellite. 
This was troublesome work, but it paid in the future. The samples of water from our trip were taken to the biological station, where Kuchin at once went to work with the filtering and determination of the proportion of chlorine. Our German shipmate, the oceanographer Schroer, left us at Bergen. On July 23rd, the Fram left Bergen and arrived on the following day at Christiansand, where I met her. Here we again had a series of busy days. In one of the custom house warehouses were piled a quantity of things that had to go on board, no less than four hundred bundles of dried fish, all our ski and sledging outfit, a wagon load of timber, etc. At Fredriksholm, out on Flecko, we had found room for perhaps the most important of all, the passengers. The ninety-seven Eskimo dogs, which had arrived from Greenland in the middle of July, on the steamer Hans E. The ship had a rather long and rough passage, and the dogs were in not very good condition on their arrival. But they had not been many days in the island, under the supervision of Hassel and Lindstrom, before they again were in full vigor. A plentiful supply of fresh meat worked wonders. The usually peaceful island, with the remains of the old fortress, resounded day by day, and sometimes at night, with the most glorious concerts of howling. These musical performances attracted a number of inquisitive visitors, who were anxious to submit the members of the chorus to a closer examination, and therefore, at certain times, the public were admitted to see the animals. It soon turned out that the majority of the dogs, far from being ferocious or shy, were, on the contrary, very appreciative of these visits. They sometimes came in for an extra tidbit in the form of a sandwich or something of the sort. Besides which, it was a little diversion in their life of captivity, so uncongenial to an arctic dog, for every one of them was securely chained up. This was necessary, especially to prevent fighting amongst themselves. It happened not infrequently that one or more of them got loose, but the two guardians were always ready to capture the runaways. One enterprising rascal started to swim over the sound to the nearest land. The object of his expedition was undoubtedly certain unsuspecting sheep that were grazing by the shore, but his swim was interrupted in time. After the Fram's arrival, Wisting took over the position of dog-keeper in Hassel's place. He and Lindstrom stayed close to the island where the dogs were. Wisting had a way of his own with the four-footed subject, and was soon on a confidential footing with them. He also showed himself to be possessed of considerable veterinary skill, an exceedingly useful qualification in this case, where there was often some injury or other to be attended to. As I have already mentioned, up to this time, no member of the expedition, except Lieutenant Nelson, knew anything of the extension of plan that had been made. Therefore, amongst the things that came on board, and amongst the preparations that were made during our stay at Christiansen, there must have been a great deal that appeared very strange to those who, for the present, were only looking forward to a voyage round Cape Horn to San Francisco. What was the object of taking all these dogs on board and transporting them all that long way? And if it came to that, would any of them survive the voyage round the formidable promontory? Besides, were there not dogs enough, and good dogs too, in Alaska? Why was the whole after-deck full of coal? What was the use of all these planks and boards? Would it not have been so much more convenient to take all the kind of goods on board in Frisco? These and many similar questions began to pass from man to man. Indeed, their very faces began to resemble notes of interrogation. Not that anyone asked me. Far from it. It was the second command who had to bear the brunt and answer as well as he could. An extremely thankless and unpleasant task for a man who already had his hands more than full. In order to relieve his difficult situation, I resolved, shortly before leaving Christiansen, to inform Lieutenants Prestron and Yurtsen of the true state of affairs. After having signed an undertaking of secrecy, they received full information of the intended dash to the South Pole, and an explanation of the reasons for keeping the whole thing secret. When asked whether they wished to take part in the new plan, they both answered at once in the affirmative, and that settled it. There were now three men on board, all the officers, who were acquainted with the situation, and were thus in a position to parry troublesome questions and remove possible anxieties on the part of the uninitiated. Two of the members of the expedition, joined during the stay of Christiansen, 
Hassel, and Lindstrom, and one change was made. The engineer, Eliason, was discharged. It was no easy matter to find a man who possessed the qualifications for taking over the post of engineer to the Fram. Few, or perhaps no one, in Norway could be expected to have much knowledge of the motors of the size of ours. The only thing to be done was to go to the place where the engine had been built, to Sweden. Diesel's firm in Stockholm helped us out of the difficulty. They sent us the man, and it afterwards turned out that he was the right man. Newt Sundbeck was his name. A chapter might be written on the good work that the man did, and the quiet, unestatious way in which he did it. From the very beginning he had assisted in the construction of the Fram's motor, so that he knew his engine thoroughly. He treated it as his darling, therefore there was never anything the matter with it. It may truly be said that he did honor to his firm and the nation to which he belongs. Meanwhile, we were hard at work, getting ready to sail. We decided to leave before the middle of August, the sooner the better. The Fran had been in dry dock, where the hull was thoroughly coated with composition. Heavily laden as the ship was, the false keel was a good deal injured by the severe pressure on the blocks, but with the help of a diver, the damage was quickly made good. The many hundred bundles of dried fish were squeezed in the main hold, full as it was. All sledging and ski outfit was carefully stowed away, so as to be protected as far as possible from the damp. These things had to be kept dry, otherwise they would become warped and useless. Bjaaland had charge of his outfit, and he knew how it should be treated. As is right and proper, when all the goods had been shipped, it was the turn of the passengers. The Fram was anchored off Fredericksholm, and the necessary preparations were immediately made for receiving our four-footed friends, under the expert direction of Bjaaland and Studerob. As many as possible of the crew were set to work with axe and saw, and in the course of a few hours the Fram had got a new deck. This consisted of loose pieces of decking, which could easily be raised and removed for flushing and cleaning. This false deck rested on the three-inch planks nailed to the ship's deck. Between the latter and the loose deck, there was therefore considerable space, the object of which was a double one. Namely, to let the water, which would unavoidably be shipped on such a voyage, run off rapidly, and allow air to circulate, and thus keeping the space below the animals as cool as possible. This arrangement afterwards proved very successful. The bulwarks on the fore part of the Fram's deck consisted of an iron railing covered with wire netting, in order to provide both shade and shelter from the wind. A lining of boards was now put up along the inside of the railing, and chains were fastened in all possible and impossible places to tie the dogs up to. There could be no question of letting them go loose. To begin with, at any rate, possibly we might hope to be at least a set free later on, when they knew their masters better, and were more familiar with their surroundings generally. Late in the afternoon of August ninth, we were ready to receive our new shipmates, and they conveyed across from the island in a big lighter, twenty at a time. Wisting and Lindstrom superintended the work of transport, and maintained order capitally. They had succeeded in gaining the dog's confidence, and at the time their complete respect. Just what we wanted. Fact. At the Fram's gangway, the dogs came in for an active and determined reception, and before they had recovered from their surprise and fright, they were securely fastened on deck and given to understand with all politeness that the best thing they could do for the time was to accept the situation with calmness. The whole proceeding went so rapidly that in the course of a couple hours we had all the ninety-seven dogs on board and had found room for them. But it must be added that the Fram's deck was utilized to the utmost, we had thought we should be able to keep the bridge free, but this could not be done if we were to take them all with us. The last boat load, fourteen in number, had to be accommodated there. All that was left was a little free space for the man at the wheel. As for the officer of the watch, it looked as if he would be badly off for elbow room. There was reason to fear that he would be compelled to kill time by standing sock still in one spot through the whole watch. But then, just there, there was no time for small troubles of the sort. No sooner was the last dog on board than we set about putting visitors ashore, and then the motor began working the windlass under the forecastle. The anchor's up. Full speed ahead in the voyage towards our goal, 16,000 miles away was begun. Quietly and unobserved, we went out on the fjord at dusk. A few of our friends accompanied us out. 
After the pilot had left us outside Fleco, it was not long before the darkness of the August evening hid the outlines of the country from our view, but Oxo and Riven flashed their farewells to us all through the night. End of section 7 Recording by Greg Bell Katy, Texas